What's up everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, we're gonna talk about modular congruence and this is meant to be an introduction. So we're gonna look at a really intuitive way of thinking about modular congruence, look at some examples, then look at another way to define it that is a little more productive for writing proofs and then actually at the end, prove that these two different definitions are equivalent. So hopefully you get something out of this video. We're just gonna go ahead and start with unpacking what does this mean? A is congruent to B mod n. What does this mean? Well, the most intuitive way, in my opinion, to think about it is that a is congruent to b mod n means that a and b have the same remainder when divided by n. So let's write out some examples here. For example, 15 is congruent to 7 mod 2. Why is that? Well, because when I divide 15 by 2, I have a remainder of 1. And when I divide 7 by 2, I have a remainder of 1. 15 and 7 both have the same remainder when divided by 2. Therefore, 15 and 7 are congruent mod 2. Let's look at another example. Let's change it up to mod 3. We have something like this. 11 is congruent to 23 in mod 3. So when we divide 11 by 3, we get a remainder of 2. When we divide 23 by 3, we get a remainder of 2. Same remainder when divided by 3, so they are congruent mod 3. And there's ways we can actually write this out and expand this, and we often do this. So going all the way back to like elementary school, one way we may have thought of remainders or division is like, oh, we can divide 15 by 2, and we just write the quotient here. Like, oh, 2 goes into 15 seven times, and then we write a little r and a little 1, right? And so we want to make that a little more precise. That's certainly a fine way to think about it if you're just trying to check in your head whether two integers are congruent in some mod n, right, then that's perfectly fine. But we want a more precise way to write this, a little bit more formal, and we do that using what's often referred to as the division algorithm. When I have something like this, a divided by n, I can write a equals n q plus r, where q is often referred to as the quotient and r is often referred to as the remainder. Right, and this aligns with how we often think about division, which is how many times does n go into a, right? For example, when we think about 15 divided by two, we may think about how many twos go into 15, how many twos can I add to get to 15, right? And so that's really our quotient here, is it's like this multiple of n, how many n's go into a, right? And then we have some amount left over, and this amount is always greater than or equal to zero, Right? If a itself is a multiple of n, then it goes in an even number of times when we have a remainder of 0. But it's always less than n, because if it were bigger, then we'd, ever to, we'd be able to put another n in. Right, Another n would go into a, if that makes sense. So using this, this is going to come up a lot, by the way. Really important. Using this, we can write this out as, well, 15 equals, again, we're thinking about how many times does 2 go into 15? Well, that's 7. And then there's one left over. So we have our quotient and remainder, and we can write 7 in the same way. Well, how many 2's go into 7? That's 3, and we have 1 left over, and we can see that the remainders are the same. Therefore, they're congruent mod 2, right, as we previously discussed. Here again, let's do these two examples. 23 is equal to, well, I'm thinking about how many times does 3 go into 23? That's 7, and there's 2 left over. And now I'm thinking about 11, and I'm thinking about how many times does 3 go into 11? That's 3, and there's 2 left over. So again, we're seeing that same remainder, and at this point I encourage you to pause the video, try some examples on your own. Look at examples of other numbers that are congruent, mod 2, mod 3, maybe try mod 4, right? For example, we could look at stuff like 31 is congruent to 19 mod 4. Think about why this is true. See if you can come up with other examples. This is really good for building intuition, right? But moving forward, I want to focus on this section here, looking at this division algorithm part. Notice that we had this plus 1, plus 1. The remainders are the same. That's the way we defined it, right? So think about what happens when we subtract 15 and 7, and that's the remainders are going to cancel. It's going to become plus 1, minus 1. And this leads perfectly into the second way of defining modular congruence. And in fact, this is often the way it's originally defined. Like textbooks often start with this and then later prove that this implies that A and B have the same remainder when divided by N. 
I personally like it the other way around because I like to start with the most intuitive definition first, then go to something that's a little more abstract, right? Because looking at this, it's hard to really build that intuition for that relationship between A and B. We're thinking in that same remainder way, it's a lot easier, in my opinion. So we started with that, we're now going with this, we're saying that both of these are equivalent ways of thinking about modular congruence, which we're going to prove toward the end of this video. But I really want to help you understand why saying n divides a minus b is the same as saying a and b have the same remainder when divided by n. Let's go back and see if we can understand that. And again, we're looking at these remainders. What, happen when, what happens when I subtract a minus b? Those remainders are going to cancel, right? For example, 15 minus 7, if I write them out in this expanded form, this n times q plus r form, then what's going to happen is I'm going to have 2 times 7 plus 1 minus 2 times 3 plus 1, right? And what's going to happen is that plus 1 and that minus 1 are going to cancel, and I'm going to end up with a multiple of 2 minus a multiple of 2, which itself is a multiple of 2, right? And saying a multiple of 2 is the same as saying divisible by 2, right? So if a minus b is a multiple of n, then n divides a minus b. And hopefully you can see that because these remainders, when we subtract, are always going to cancel. And what we're going to be left with is, in this case, a multiple of 2. In this case, a multiple of 3, right? So these remainders canceling are is really key to understanding why this n divides a minus b definition is equivalent. But again, this is really the preferred definition for writing proofs. For writing proofs, this definition is really efficient. When we write proofs from here on out, this is what we're going to use. But intuitively, this first one makes more sense. If I'm just trying to come up with numbers that are congruent, this is how I think about it in terms of remainders, right? Or if I'm trying to determine whether two numbers are congruent, or even if I'm trying to understand why a statement about modular congruence is true, or whether it's true or not, this is how I'm thinking. This is the intuitive way, this is the efficient proof writing way, and now let's prove that these are equivalent. So a and b have the same remainder when divided by n, if and only if n divides a minus b. Let's first prove the forward direction, because that's what we just looked at as being pretty intuitive, this idea of subtracting these numbers and the remainders canceling. Let's apply that to the proof, and it's going to be pretty cool because what we're going to see is that the proof looks exactly like that. It is very intuitive. Once we see that, the proof follows it very beautifully. So let's first suppose... All right, so let's suppose that A and B have the same remainder when divided by N. So what that means is that a can be written as n times some quotient plus some remainder. So I'm using q1 and r1 to represent a's quotient and remainder. And here I can use q2 and r2. But remember, we are assuming that they have the same remainder when divided by n, which means we don't need an r1 and r2 here. We can call them both r because we're the same, right? So this is our assumption. A and B have the same remainder when divided by N, and that means we can write them each out in this way where the remainders are equivalent. And now we can show what happens when we subtract A minus B. Then A minus B, what happens? Well, we're going to see this cancellation of the remainders. N times Q1 plus R minus N times Q2 plus R Right, and we know that that equals n times q1 minus n times q2. And we can see, again, we have this difference of multiples of n, which itself is a multiple of n. We could write it out this way. We could factor out the n, right, q1 minus q2. And now how, this, how does this prove what we wanted to show, right? We should have wrote our want to show out statement down here. So our scratch work, let's think about what it is we're trying to show again n divides a minus b, which is saying that a minus b can be written as n times some integer, right? And that's exactly what we've done here. We have a minus b, we have n times an integer, right? This q1 minus q2, these are each integers, so itself is the element 
of the set of integers. So maybe we need one final concluding sentence here saying therefore a minus b is n times an integer and hence n divides a minus b. But this is really it. This proof was 100% informed by our intuition and really playing around with examples and noticing that remainder canceling phenomena that we did. Pretty cool. Love this proof. The reverse direction Let's see if we can do that now. The reverse direction. So now we're going to assume that n divides a minus b. So let's write our backward arrow here. So suppose. All right, so I suppose that n divides a minus b. And let's go ahead and write out what that means. So a minus b equals n times k for some integer k. All right, so again, just using the definition, unpacking my assumption here. Now let's think ahead of what it is we're trying to show. We're trying to show that a and b have the same remainder when divided by n. So what we can do, and again, this direction is not quite as intuitive as the forward direction, but what we can say is let's let b equal n times some quotient plus some remainder, and then try to show that a can be written as n times some quotient plus that same remainder. So I do want to specify here that this remainder is greater than or equal to 0 and less than n, right? So this pair, quotient remainder, is unique to b. We can write b in this way, no problem. We can do this, this is allowed. And again, from this, what we want to show is that a can be written as n times really just some integer here, right, plus are that same remainder. That's what we're interested in. And I think we can do that using a combination of these equations here, 1 and 2. Using those two equations, we can do a substitution. We can replace that b in that first equation with n times q plus r. And if we do that, I think we can get what we want. So let's try that. I'm going to erase because I feel like I might need some room here. So from 1 and 2, let's go and write that out. Then then what happens? Well, a minus n times q plus r equals n times k. All right, now we can distribute this negative, right? We can get rid of our parentheses here. So a minus n q minus r equals n times k. And hopefully you see how this is going to work now. Because remember, thinking ahead, we wanted to write a equals n times some integer plus that same remainder here. And I think we can get that if we add n times q to both sides. And I'm going to go ahead and do two things in one step just so I don't run out of room here. I'm also going to add r to both sides. And when I do that, what I can write down here is a equals nk plus nq plus r. And then what I can do is I can factor out this n. And I can write n times k plus q plus r. And what this is, again, what this shown is that a is equal to n times, this is our quotient in this case, but what's really important here is that we have the same remainder, right? And so this actually proves this direction. We made our assumption, we showed exactly what we're going to show, that these have the same remainder. And hopefully this makes sense. There's a few different ways you can actually approach this direction that are all slightly similar, but a little different. Hopefully this makes sense. So again, just to summarize, A is congruent to B, mod N means that A and B have the same remainder when divided by N. So this is what I think of as sort of the like intuitive definition. If I'm just trying to think about whether two numbers are congruent or whether some statement about congruence is true, this is how I'm thinking in terms of remainders. This is the second different definition we show, this is really useful for proofs, right? n divides a minus b. And then I figured I'd show this third one. This comes up in textbooks. Um, I didn't talk about it in this video, but it's so related to the second one, right? Because if we write out what this second one means, it means a minus b equals n times k, and we can just add b to both sides. So it's so related that I didn't figure I needed to expand on it, but I'll show it here because you may see it. But again, I sort of really use these first two. Intuitive definition, definition for proofs. Hopefully this video helped. Hopefully you made sense. Leave any comments, questions, that sort of thing below. Like the video, subscribe, but most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. And I'll see y'all later.